Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at Max Jet. If you recall from our previous episode, which looked at Silverjet, Max Jet was one of a handful of young airlines operating transatlantic or business class services. Interestingly though, Max Jet didn't start life with that goal. In fact, Max Jet didn't even start life as Max Jet. Skylink Airways was formed in the winter of 2003 by Kenneth T. Carlson and Joshua B. Marks. Carlson had plenty of airline experience, having been involved in a number of airlines including Jet Express and Midway Airlines. Mark, on the other hand, was a Harvard Business School graduate who was a lecturer at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, making for an interesting pairing. Carlson would take up the role of chief executive, with Marks taking on the position of company president. Having seen the immediate success and rapid growth of JetBlue, Skylink wanted to capitalise on this second boom of low fare air travel. Unlike existing low fare airlines, Skylink was to operate long haul flights, particularly transatlantic flights, where there was no existing low fare competition. It planned on basing its operation out of Baltimore Washington International Airport, where it would be poised to have a potentially large amount of feeder traffic coming from America's largest low fare airline, Southwest, who had a large presence at the airport. Skylink considered a number of aircraft types, particularly the Boeing 747, 757 and 767, with the airline planning on having a two-class cabin, with both an economy cabin and a business class cabin. Skylink had been quoted in the press as offering a one-way business class ticket to Europe for £370 and an economy ticket for just as little as £160. By early 2005, the airline had received its initial approval from the US authorities. The US Department of Transportation labelled the airline fit, willing and able, financially speaking. The Federal Aviation Administration, however, were taking their time in certifying the airline. For several months, Skylink had been in talks with BAA, formerly known as the British Airport Authority, with regard to operating flights to London Stansted Airport, and flights looked very much on the horizon once the FAA gave the OK, that is. The protracted certification process from the FAA led to several drastic changes at Skylink. First, on April 27, 2005, Skylink rebranded as Maxjet. This was in response to threatened legal action from a Canadian-based travel firm called Skylink Aviation. Next up, the newly named Maxjet was scrapping its two-class low-fare service and instead would offer a low-fare or business-class service. It also changed its focus from Baltimore, Washington to Washington Dulles Airport as it was believed that there would be more demand for this higher-class service from there. There was also a change in the boardroom too. Co-founder, part owner and chief executive Kenneth Carlson stepped down from his role in order to focus his efforts on fundraising for the company. Gary Rogliano, former chairman of Trans-Pacific Capital Corporation, a financial services firm, would now take on the position of chief executive. While Maxjet awaited its certification, it announced its intention to operate six flights per week between Dulles and London Stansted Airport. Located around 40 miles from London, Stansted was becoming a growing hub for low-fare airlines, particularly Ryanair and EasyJet after the former had acquired Buzz and the latter had taken over GoFly. Stansted had a bit of an unfortunate history. In the early 1990s it built a brand new terminal to entice long-haul carriers to use the airport instead of the increasingly congested Heathrow, but it could never get a service to stick. Its largest carrier was Air UK, which called the airport home, but by the late 1990s had been acquired by the Dutch flag carrier KLM and split in two. KLM UK, which was absorbed into KLM City Hopper, and Buzz, an attempt at a low-fare airline which was quickly sold to Ryanair. If Stansted could convince Maxjet to come to the airport, then there was a chance that other airlines might follow suit. Maxjet also announced its intention to operate a service between New York's JFK Airport and Stansted, with a seasonal extension to Orlando. It also revealed that it was considering international routes from Boston. All very ambitious, but by the spring of 2005, the airline still lacked both certification and an aircraft. 
Things quickly began to look up, though, with the arrival of MaxJet's first aircraft, a 20-year-old Boeing 767-200ER. Delivered to the Australian flag carrier Qantas in September 1985, the aircraft served the Flying Kangaroo for 19 years before being withdrawn and ferried to the United States. Following a year of storage, the aircraft joined the MaxJet fleet in July 2005, finally giving the airline an aircraft. The aircraft arrived wearing the initial MaxJet livery, a frankly cheap-looking white and pale blue affair that screams value jet. One can only speculate, but I believe that this was the original Skylink design, which would have been far more suitable for their low-cost carrier structure. The airline would adopt a much more classier look before beginning passenger operations, but more on that shortly. With MaxJet now having an aircraft, it was able to undertake a number of proving flights to satisfy the FAA, who would finally grant the airline the last bits of certification needed to allow it to begin passenger flights. MaxJet was now able to set a date and start selling tickets, crucially bringing in money after two years of waiting. The airline planned to begin operations at the start of November with just one route, JFK to Stansted. Before passenger services began, the airline's sole 767 went in for a repaint, losing the cheap look and coming out with a much more stylish livery befitting a business class airline. The blue and white was out in favour of shades of lilac. Three different shades would swoop across the fuselage and tail. The tail branding of Max remained in place and the titles on the forward fuselage were now much more prominent. While Silver Jet had a very grey and almost camouflage livery allowing their aircraft to blend in, the Max Jet livery would certainly make their fleet stand out. While MaxJet had aimed to be the first low-fare business class airline across the Atlantic, its protracted gestation allowed another newcomer, EOS, to pip them to the post. EOS began their New York to Stansted service on October the 18th using Boeing 757s. MaxJet took to the skies a few weeks later on November the 2nd. Two months later, two more airlines joined the fray, with the French-based Lavion and UK-based Silverjet taken to the skies. While all four airlines had similar aims to offer a premium transatlantic service, they all had different products. EOS offered a much more typical first class experience. Their seats arranged into pods which offered both comfort and privacy as the seat reclined into a fully lie flat bed. Silverjet were a little odd. Their seats were arranged 222, which when upright was more comparable with a premium economy layout of today. However, once these seats reclined into their own shell, they became almost lie flat beds complete with privacy. Silverjet also beat the competition in terms of the level of service, almost bordering on private jet levels of service from chauffeur transfers, private terminals to the amazing food and drink on board. Lavion and Maxjet both had a similar product. In my last video, I perhaps unfairly called it more of a glorified premium economy product. MaxJet also had a 222 configuration, but their seats didn't have privacy screens or recline into fully lie-flat beds. Their seats were more of a previous generation of first-class seats. They were no doubt comfy and they had good legroom, but when they were fully reclined it did look like one was risking having their head in the lap of the passenger behind. While the seating may have been a bit dated, the level of service was not. MaxJet offered on-demand in-flight entertainment which offered over 100 hours of movies, TV shows and music. This came in the form of handheld players which would be distributed by the cabin crew. While seatback screens are more popular, they're not much use if the seat in front has reclined so far back that one can no longer see the screen. There was a wide selection of food and drink too. Max Jet offered a four-course gourmet meal, beginning with canapes and champagne, followed by a selection of free hot entrees. All would be served on proper china crockery with silver cutlery and proper glasses and champagne flutes. Max Jet also offered lounge access at all of its airports. These did vary between those used exclusively by Max Jet and those which would be shared with other passengers. While this wasn't a patch on Silverjet's private terminal at nearby Luton, it was still a very much welcome feature which nowadays is expected by any business class ticket holder. As Maxjet took to the skies and joined the competition, it was already in the process of securing a second aircraft and eyeing up new routes. 
While overexpansion can easily kill off a small airline, it was pretty much the reverse for Maxjet and its competition. They needed to expand quickly to take advantage of the economy of scale, especially so considering that by operating long-haul flights, each aircraft was realistically only covering one route per day. Maxjet had initially considered bolting an Orlando flight onto its New York run, but this wasn't really practical. Summer storms in Florida would inevitably delay the New York to London flight, and as someone whose regular flight connected with an Orlando flight, I can attest to it being constantly delayed due to Florida's weather. Still, American 54-55 between Manchester and Chicago was still better than going via Heathrow. This was Maxjet's flagship route. Risking developing a reputation for delays on it was out of the question, especially so given that they had direct competition from EOS. Maxjet took delivery of its second aircraft in February 2006, another Boeing 767-200ER which was just rolling over into 22 years old. Originally delivered to Braffens safe in 1984, the aircraft saw brief stints at Tarka, Varig and Britannia before joining Transworld Airlines in 1987. Aside from a few months subleased to Gulf Air, the aircraft remained with TWA until the spring of 2001 when it was withdrawn as part of TWA's final bankruptcy, a requirement to restructure ahead of American Airlines' acquisition of the struggling carrier. The aircraft then moved to Aero Continente of Peru, sticking around for five years before being withdrawn and stored. Maxjet acquired the aircraft the following month and refurbished it ready for service. Maxjet had also intended to offer charter flights. With 102 business class seats, the airline could easily accommodate sports teams both from professional leagues right down to high school levels. Their 767 also had a much greater range than what the competing charter service carriers were offering at the time with their 737 and 757 fleets. The Maxjet 767 could also operate for up to 12 hours, making international routes a doddle. The introduction of Maxjet's second aircraft gave the airline both breathing room to operate its existing schedule with reduced risk of delays and also allowed the airline to begin offering its charter services. However, while charter services can bring in money, they don't offer a steady revenue stream. For that, Maxjet would need to expand its scheduled services. A third Boeing 767 arrived in mid-June. This one wore a nondescript blue and white livery which was then adorned with Maxjet branding making it stand out from the rest of the fleet, though it was expected to be repainted in due course. This aircraft had been delivered to Kuwait Airways in 1986 making this bird 20 years old. Interestingly, this aircraft was one of three Boeing 767s delivered to Kuwait Airways, and thanks to it being down route when Iraq invaded Kuwait, it was saved unlike its two sister ships which were stolen and flown to Iraq with the intention of being pressed into service with Iraqi Airways, but destroyed by Allied forces during bombing runs on Mosul. With Kuwait Airways having just one remaining 767, it made it somewhat non-standard, so its remaining time with the airline was going to be limited. The airline was leased out to Qatar Airways, at the time a brand new airline from the Gulf, as well as spending a few months with Polynesian Airlines. The aircraft then moved to Turkish charter carrier Bergen Air, who went bust the following year after the loss of a 767 just off the coast of the Dominican Republic. Actually, the aircraft had quite a varied airline history. Aside from time with Lan Chile, it also spent time with Alas Nacionales of the Dominican Republic, Air Gabon, Phoenix Aviation of Kyrgyzstan, Khmer of Afghanistan, and AVE of the UAE. With the fleet now standing at free aircraft, Maxjet were able to introduce a new route, Washington Dulles to London Stansted. This new route would operate five days per week with no flight scheduled on Tuesdays and Saturdays. The New York to London route operated six days a week with no flights on Saturdays. The introduction of a third aircraft also allowed Maxjet to develop its charter services. The carrier would go on to operate numerous charter flights for a variety of clients including sports teams, Fortune 500 companies, specialist tour groups and the US military. As I said earlier however, while charters bring in cash, they don't provide a steady revenue stream and thus more expansion was on the cards. Las Vegas would be Maxjet's next choice of destination with the inaugural flight depart in London Stansted on November 2nd, exactly one year since Maxjet itself took to the skies. 
It may have seemed like an odd choice, perhaps even a gamble. However, the UK was the second largest market for visitors to Las Vegas, so offering affordable business class services from London had the potential to pay out. November also saw changes in the MaxJet boardroom. CEO Gary Rogliano departed to pursue other interests. He was replaced by Bill Stockbridge. The current chairman of MaxJet, who had been instrumental in getting the airline off the ground thanks to his experience in the industry, having founded Gemini Air Cargo and served as the CEO of Centurion Air Cargo and had previously been a senior vice president and chief operating officer of Presidential Airways in the 1980s. Rick Sharp, a member of the MaxJet board, would take over the position of chairman. Despite the changes in the boardroom, MaxJet itself continued on as normal, with no drastic changes taking place. The airline continued to offer a reliable and affordable business class service on its free routes, as well as to continue operating numerous ad hoc charters. The airline still planned on launching further routes, and had also agreed to take on another two aircraft in the spring of 2007. These two aircraft joined the MaxJet fleet just one day apart in mid-April. Both were sister ships having been delivered to Air Mauritius in 1988 and they'd served the tiny flag carrier loyally until their withdrawal in late 2006. Both aircraft were then fitted out with the all business class interior and painted into the easily recognisable MaxJet livery. With the MaxJet fleet now standing at five aircraft, the airline adjusted its schedules, adding a Saturday flight to the New York route making it a daily service between London and New York. MaxJet also announced its newest destination, Los Angeles. Flights from London Stansted to Los Angeles would begin on August 29th. The airline also added a Sunday flight to the Las Vegas route, making it a three times per week service. MaxJet now operated on four routes with its own metal. However, the airline also attempted to offer connections with other airlines. As MaxJet was not on a main distribution system, it couldn't offer free booking. However, its website listed all of the relevant connecting flights from several airlines from its airports to numerous destinations. This was one thing that the competition didn't do. Another thing was a frequent flyer program. The Max Flyer program was in its early infancy and was little more than a mailing list. However, the airline intended to offer points and rewards, even backdating points for flights taken all the way back to November 2005. The Max Flyer program was very generous. A round trip would earn 200 points, and it was possible to redeem a round trip for just 3,200 points, far more generous than what we have these days. MaxJet's biggest rival, EOS, increased the frequency of flights on its New York to Stansted route to a staggering four flights per day. The carrier also looked at several new routes from Stansted, including Boston, Washington DC and Los Angeles. The latter two would compete directly with MaxJet's own services. EOS also announced a myriad of new routes to start the following year, including New York to Paris and Stansted to Newark and Dubai. While EOS already competed with MaxJet on the JFK route, there was also no doubt that the route to Newark would steal passengers off the Kennedy run. Dubai was an interesting choice, however. EOS announced their intention to launch the route in 2008. MaxJet was also hinting at this new destination, and British-based Silverjet began operating London Luton to Dubai that October. The interest in Dubai certainly raised a few eyebrows, however, Silverjet CEO Lawrence Hunt explained that Dubai has attracted large levels of investment and development over recent years to become a globally acclaimed destination for both business and leisure travellers alike, with premium air traffic to the Emirates growing at 20% year on year, this new route represents an exciting opportunity for Silverjet. Still up and coming destination or not, if all three airlines went ahead with their proposed routes they would surely be tapping the market dry with such duplication and no doubt there would be casualties. MaxJet would be the first to stumble when on December 7, 2007 the airline requested that the London Stock Exchange Alternative Investment Market suspends the trading of the airline's shares pending clarification of its financial position. Despite having carried over 100,000 passengers since taking to the skies two years earlier, the airline had been making substantial losses. 
In 2006, MaxJet made an operating loss of $21.99 million and, more disturbingly, had reported a loss of $31.9 million for the first six months of 2007. The airline needed to raise money and fast. Sales had almost doubled from 15.7 million to 27.3 million. However, this was not going to cover the losses, cover the day to day operations, and also fund the much needed expansion. Remember, while over expansion is what usually kills startup airlines, in the case of MaxJet and its competitors, they needed to rapidly expand in order to take advantage of the economy of scale and reduce costs. The suspension of share trading caught the market by surprise. Howard Wielden, a senior strategic at BGC Partners, said the news was shocking. The whole thing came as a total shock to the market, and it does make you question whether or not they've got the right model. British Airways and some of the other big carriers seem to be doing fine with their transatlantic services, so you really must ask about MaxJet. He added, We have no details whatsoever about this review of the finances. It would be surprising if they've just run out of money. But then again, we just don't know the state of play. What's that, son? Speak up. Um, well, I, I was just saying um, that's why they call it space, because, uh, well, there's a lot of it. Thank you very much. Just be quiet, please. MaxJet was in dire need of financing, however it found itself struggling to find anyone willing to throw it a lifeline. The suspension of share trading really put off anyone that had been previously willing to invest in the airline. After all, why risk investing in an airline that is in such a bad position that it's had to suspend share trading? Despite this, there was a glimmer of hope. The airline was reportedly in talks with an unnamed party regarding a rescue package. Unfortunately, Santa Claus didn't deliver, and on Christmas Eve 2007, the airline filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and ceased operations. This move was particularly unusual. Chapter 11 allows a company, or in this case an airline, to continue operating but to give it breathing room from creditors and allow it to reorganise and hopefully come out of bankruptcy. In the case of MaxJet, however, the board knew that with no rescue deal on the horizon, the airline's demise would be inevitable and that the best thing to do would be to cease operations. There is a short epilogue to this story. Although MaxJet was grounded, the company still existed and even came close to resuming operations. In March 2008, it was reported that the NCA Sports Group was in talks to acquire the airline. NCA specialised in arranging charter flights for college sport teams and their fans and were hoping to revive the airline as NCA MaxJet. Kevin Clark, NCA Chief Executive Officer, said in a statement that We believe that it's time for a smart luxury charter service that combines comfort, value and flexibility. The plan was to resume operations as a specialist charter carrier, initially with two Boeing 767s and operating sports charters, then hopefully grow as business took off. Pardon the pun. NCA established a holding company ready to welcome MaxJet into its fold, and MaxJet had applied to the US Department of Transportation for the approval of the transfer of certification assets and the resumption of services. Unfortunately, in early August, it was announced that the takeover had fallen through for unspecified reasons. MaxJet withdrew its applications from the DOT and the airline remained grounded. Permanently. So, what went wrong? Well, I'm going to be honest, MaxJet failed for pretty much the same reason as Silverjet did. Undercapitalization, very slow expansion and unfortunate timing. It took MaxJet two years to take to the skies following its formation as Skylink. This prolonged gestation period not only cost the airline money directly in the form of outgoings, but also indirectly, as by the time MaxJet took to the skies it had missed out on the busy summer period when passenger loads would have been at their highest. MaxJet did eventually take to the skies and was soon reporting good load factors. Out of the three competing carriers, MaxJet had the largest route network, with four destinations being served from London Stansted, these being Washington DC, New York, Las Vegas and Los Angeles. EOS focused entirely on operating multiple flights per day between New York and London. Silverjet, on the other hand, had a twice daily service to New York and a daily service to Dubai. Expansion was the key to survival. While rapid expansion is usually the downfall of small airlines, in the case of MaxJet, Silverjet and EOS, it was a necessity. It all comes down to the economy of scale. 
By growing their fleet, an airline can spread out the cost of spare parts, equipment and even the crew, who will be limited on certain aircraft types. By developing a large route network, an airline is not only reaching more potential customers but also giving itself an opportunity to use a well-performing route to cross-subsidise a new and underperforming route. The potential expansion into Dubai is interesting though. Silverjet were already operating the route from London Luton and EOS had announced their intention to operate a competing service from Stansted. Was there really the need for free airlines to serve the same route? Come to think of it, if all free airlines operated routes from London to New York, one has to wonder, hypothetically, had they not collapsed when they did, would all free airlines survive with such duplication on routes going forward? Maxjet, Silverjet and EOS catered to similar but different markets. EOS was purely a business class airline and was aiming entirely on the business traveller. Silverjet was aiming to bring first class travel to the masses by making it more affordable. It was still aiming for the business traveller as well as regular folks who might be able to afford splashing out on a fancy trip for a special occasion. Maxjet however catered more for the leisure traveller. It still offered a premium product and it was affordable. Its route network would easily suit regular folks who had just a little bit of extra money for their trip. So yes, hypothetically I believe that all three may have survived had it not been for another classic grounded reason. Bad timing. By the end of 2007 the global economy had begun to slow down pretty drastically. A result of this was less people being able to afford to travel. While Maxjet tickets were very affordable, they were still more expensive than regular economy tickets and the legacy airlines could easily lower their economy fares to undercut the likes of Maxjet, Silverjet and Dios. This was partially down to their vastly larger route networks, but also their multi-class cabins, which could subsidise the relevant transatlantic routes until the competition was gone. Heck, it's happened before and it'll happen again. While the economy was slowing down, there was one thing that wasn't slowing, the increasing cost of fuel. When Maxjet took to the skies, oil prices were around $45 a barrel. However, by the time that Maxjet called it quits, it was nearly double that at around $80 a barrel and rising fast. In fact, within a few months, oil prices would rise to over $130 a barrel. One more hypothetical question is, could Maxjet have survived on its original business model? Would a long-haul, low-cost carrier be able to not only survive, but prosper? Well, it's certainly a tough one. There had been numerous attempts to operate such a carrier, from Lakers Skytrain and People Express, to the more recent Zoom, Wow Air and Norwegian Ventures, and all failed. Though they failed for various reasons, they all had one thing that Maxjet didn't have, an established short-haul feeder network. Maxjet's original business plan relied on feeder traffic from other low fare airlines including Southwest at Baltimore and Ryanair at Stansted. Neither offered any type of through ticketing and relying on passengers to self-connect is risky as it is of course not particularly appealing. After all, delays happen and a self-connecting passenger risks missing their connection and then being forced to buy tickets at a higher price. Ruling out connecting passengers meant that the airline would be relying entirely on O&D or origin and destination traffic and I doubt that there was sufficient demand for such a low fare, no frills, long haul service on these routes. I honestly don't think that the original plan would have worked. Zoom Airlines, which was based in Canada, was already a low fare transatlantic airline. Despite having a varied route network and regular charter work on top, Zoom ceased operations just months after Maxjet. Ultimately, Maxjet failed because of the global recession. Had they come around a few years later after the worst of it had passed, then there would surely be a big hit. The market has changed over the past decade and a half. More people are travelling than ever, including those who want a better than economy, but still affordable experience. Just look how popular premium economy is with the legacy carriers. The same could be said of both Silverjet and Dios. Then again, just like also many airlines covered in this series, if they had another chance, it would have worked out so much better. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions, or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry. I've got a contact form on my website. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. I have plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.